Well, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for attending our technical evening tonight. Um, great to see all the faces. Just would like to welcome all, all the members, any new members there, and of course visitors that may be attending tonight. Um, shows you how much interest everybody has in these blasting qualifications. So, uh, gives me great pleasure now to hand over to our distinguished member and past chairman, uh, Mr. David Johnson, who's going to give us uh, a. <laughs> Is going to give us a presentation on blasting qualifications. As you all are aware, there's been uh, quite a bit of talk about this this last few months um, following Ken's, Ken Logan's sort of observations, should I say, through, through the industry. And he thinks that we need training as managers and four men, etc., etc. So We've got this course sort of put together. David's done a lot of work uh, on trying to get it all um, put together along with MPQC, et cetera. So um, I'll pass on to David and let him explain the rest to you. Good evening, everybody, and, and thanks, John. I hope we'll live up to uh, the introduction. As you know, there's a letter from HSE last year um, about training and very explicit. Uh, about what training had to be given. Uh, there's been several meetings since that, and what I hope to do this evening is give a back, bit of background um, in terms of the legal context, the operator's duties, uh, quarry development plans, appointment of contractors, uh, looking at the duty holders and then competence of the operator or their appointed quarry manager, because the operator for a manager as well as uh, the owner of the company uh, or you can have somebody that they appoint and then finally we'll look at the, the training options that will be available and what might be the most relevant there's a few names I don't recognize this evening so um, just quickly uh, my company is Jab S Safety Solutions 17 years I've, I've been working and self-employed and there's really three areas to my business. One is consultancy, um, mainly to the quarry industry, some construction companies or subcontractors really, and then uh, some engineering and, and conveyor belt companies. Training, BMAC training, do a lot of training for them on NEBOSH and IOSH courses up to diploma level, both in health and safety and um, environmental and we can also design bespoke training courses uh, which wouldn't have accreditation of, of MPQC or NEBOSH or IOSH but will meet the needs and um, uh, since 2004 I've been doing NVQ assessment uh, originally that was for a, a company uh, based here but mainly operating in Scotland and they decided to pull out of the extractives their uh, business and for the last two and a half years uh, I've had my own NVQ assessment centre mainly in Scotland but at the moment there's quite a lot of companies taking up um, NVQs for people who have been promoted or for plant operators or process operators. So in terms of what I can deliver through NVQs level two assessment and mobile plant process and operations uh, drilling and, and face profiling, uh, level three assessment and shot firing and process uh, supervision, which is a new qualification uh, just released uh, at the beginning of the year, just in January. Uh, level five assessment and shot firing supervision and then the safety, health and environmental management and extractives at levels four, six and seven. I also uh, work for MPQC as a blast auditor. There's, I think we're down to about five or six of us now, but anybody who has an MPQC uh, blasting qualification competency card, it expires every five years and I can come out on behalf of MPQC and audit, be an explosive supervisor, shot fire, profiler, uh, beetle operator, um, and driller. Um, so that would be 
book through MPQC, but I do that on, on their behalf and have done in the province for two or three companies. So that's just an overview of, of what uh, I do. Um, so getting into the real business. The legal context, um, the Health and Safety at Work Order in NI 1978 is the main piece of health and safety legislation. Um, and if when it came in 1978, it mirrors the Health and Safety at Work Act on the mainland. It allows the, the making of regulations and it sets out the general principles of what we have to do, including health and safety policies and so on. The main two pieces of, of legislation that are relevant to, to tonight are the Corey's Regs, Northern Ireland 2006, and the, the Corey's Explosives Regs, NI 2006. Unlike the mainland, uh, where the, the core, there's a, an explosives section within the, the Corey's Regs, 1999, the, the, because of the influence of the Northern Ireland office, the two pieces of uh, legislation were separated, um, but they cover the main two, uh, all the main regs uh, as the quarry regs in the mainland do. There are two pieces of legislation that reference each other. If it's a hard rock quarry, you can't separate them. Uh, there's sections in both that relate to the other um, and they need to be kept and worked as one, really. Um, approved codes of practice. The Quarries Regs ACOP 1999 is applicable in Northern Ireland, excluding Section 5, which is the explosive section, uh, Regs 24 to 29. Uh, which is then covered by the Quarries Explosive Regs, NI 2006, ACOP and Guidance. Uh, so it replaces Section 5 uh, of the, the Quarry Regs 99 ACOP. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail in, in those pieces of legislation. We will refer to them. Uh, a lot of the rest of the slides that I have tonight come from those documents. Um, and it looks at duties in relation to blasting. So the operator, the company who own the quarry, or if it's a family firm, the individual quarry owner, um, they have duties um, under the regs. And there is a lot of the duties uh, of the operator that apply. The first and the main one is the design of the quarry, any plant or buildings. So you can't just get a piece of land with a rock on it and, and start and go ahead. There has to be some thought, some planning into how you're going to work the quarry, face heights, uh, where you're going to locate lagoons or settlement ponds, where you're going to put your plant uh, and any buildings. Uh, and of course, buildings have to be able to stand um, vibration levels from blasting. There's also the health and safety document, which is a quite a big document. Um, and it looks at, um, if you look at um, section seven of, of the ACOP, um, it look, talks about what should be in there. So management structures should be in there, how you, and that would include any specialist contractors, consultants with specific roles, such as your, geotechnical uh, specialist. There has to be an appointment of competent people. Now, there's appointments and authorizations. Uh, so appointments are people who have a, a legal duty under the regs where authorizations would be the likes of your mobile plant operators that you authorize to carry out a certain role within the, the company. And as part of the health and safety document, any duty holder uh, must have roles and responsibilities clearly defined. Uh, you can't keep expanding it and stretching it. Uh, it has to be written, has to be clearly defined. And one of the big areas is that the operator must ensure that any arrangements that he puts in place, so how you do risk assessments, permit to work schemes, um, who you appoint, 
must make sure that the arrangements within the health and safety document are implemented and complied with. Uh, it's not enough to have the rules. You must be monitoring uh, what people are doing um, and set out a, a schedule for that. So part of the whole over uh, management uh, health and safety document is a quarry development plan. And it is very much a structured plan, including work and drawings on how to work the quarry. It takes into account the geology of the rock. It has input from your geotechnical assessment, your, your specialist. There should be input from explosive supervisor uh, and also the quarry manager. Now, some of the bigger uh, companies have got what they call a states team who look at all of this, but you know, in the Northern Ireland context, that's few and far between. Um, so all of these people must have an input into the quarry development plan. There must be cooperation. Uh, they must look at the design, deciding uh, face heights, haul roads, the direction that you actually work the face, uh, how drilling and blasting is, uh, or winning of rock is carried out, uh, location of settlement ponds, drainage, uh, because especially the weather we're having at the minute, if you've got water coming through the face and you've got a freeze-thaw effect, that can cause a, a failure. Um, so this quarry development plan is key. And obviously for hard rock quarries, your blast and how you blast it uh, will have a big, big uh, input. If you're blasting rock in the wrong direction, you can end up with top limb failures. You can end up with slides, um, wedge failures, which put uh, people at risk that's working at the face. Uh, it also can lead to an efficient blasting where you don't get the right fragmentation to suit your plant and that all costs money. So whilst it's uh, quite a bit of work to put this quarry development plan together, it does pay dividends in the long run. When it comes to contractors in general, uh, and specifically your drilling and blasting uh, contractors, you're looking for a reputable company, uh, somebody that has a track history that can prove that they deliver. There has to be a checking of competence uh, to undertake the work they're engaged in. Make sure you've got insurances in terms of public and product liability, employer's liability, professional indemnity possibly. And the quality of their documents, health and safety policy, risk assessments, method statements, do they make sense? Is there enough detail in them? Uh, are they specific to the work they're going to do for you? Look at past performance. Look at the competence of their workforce. And I've highlighted in bold print there, it says specifically about your drilling and blasting company uh, that you must monitor their performance, but that would apply to any contractor that directly delivering what you're paying them for. Um, and that means that you need to be able to prove that um, you have monitored their performance in terms of what they're producing in the muck pile, in terms of how they work, the quality of their equipment, all of those have to be monitored. And that means inspections or audits. Uh, you can't sort of just say, oh, well, I go up to the face and I have a chat with the driller. We're going to have to prove that. Some sort of note in the diary, some sort of form, checklist, uh, to say what you looked at and whether you're happy or not. So when it comes to your drill and blast contractor, the explosive supervisor manages the day-to-day -day activities in the blasting process. Um, they're the, the main point of contact. They organize the profiling, they issue instructions to the driller, they coordinate the, the blasting and uh, what day is happening coordinate, and in Northern Ireland, coordinate with the police to get a date. They have to develop the blast specification and get approval of it. Uh, by the quarry manager, and then the, the blast specification passes to the shot fire. Now, I'm assuming that these are different people. They could all be the one person. 
but HSC both here in the mainland don't particularly like that. So there's people involved and you can either appoint a company as the exposure supervisor and then they give their make their own internal appointments uh, or you can nominate a specific person to be exposure supervisor. And you can have multiple explosive supervisors on site at the same time, but one of them must be nominated as being the explosive supervisor in charge. And if there's any changes, I'd say probably a plus or minus 5% difference to the, the charge, then that must be approved by the uh, explosive supervisor. The shot fire cannot do his own thing. He cannot make major adjustments. He must consult with the explosive supervisor, whether they're on site or uh, get the hold of them. And if, God forbid, anything does go wrong, so uh, fly rock or misfires, then the explosive supervisor has the key role. He can consult with a shot fire, he can consult with the quarry manager um, as a team, but the explosive supervisor has the final say when it comes to dealing uh, both with the actual event and then following up the investigation. Now, obviously, misfires on fly rock are dangerous occurrences under radar, and uh, it's likely that the HSE will be involved in an investigation as well, jointly or separately. So, explosive supervisor, key, key person in it, the whole process. And again, going back to our health and safety document, um, either within the shot firing rules or a separate document from his company, their role needs to be set out clearly what their duties are, what their limits of responsibility are, and the, the line of reporting uh, back to senior management. The shot fire loads explosives in accordance with the blast specification and fires the shot. He's the man leading the team on the day in the absence of the explosive supervisor. He is responsible for the team that is working with him, whether they work for his company or are supplied by the quarry. Uh, he calls the shots. When the delivery arrives, he has to check the delivery, make sure there's enough explosives, boosters, detonators, any other accessories to actually fire the shot. Once he signs for the delivery, he's responsible for the security of the explosives to make sure that they are used or destroyed afterwards, that nothing goes missing. And he either loads the shot or supervises the loading of the shot. So most of these are using pump trucks. So you have a man on the hose, but the shot fire should be supervising the filling of each hole. They have to make sure that the detonation pattern is collect, correctly connected. Um, so refers to the specification, uh, make, make sure that uh, the debts, uh, be they mostly it's either non-ELs or ICON electronic debts. So make sure that they are cor correctly connected in the correct order. And one of the crucial things is that he must ensure that the danger zone is clear before firing the shot. Uh, he'll rely on the, the quarry management team to do that probably, but he has to make sure that he's satisfied uh, that the, the danger zone is clear. He then, uh, there'll be some sort of signal arrangement leading up to the shot. He'll fire the shot and then carry out a post-blast inspection where he's looking for the in the muck pile, making sure that faces are stable, that there's no misfires. Um, and if there was a misfire, then he would have to take charge and um, tell his sentries to stay in place, notify it to the explosive supervisor. Um, there should be something to say who contacts HSE to report it. And um, then, uh, assuming that we have a successful blast, he would generate the records, the actual loading of the holes, 
detonation pattern, the yield, um, and there is um, guidance in the, the ACOPS uh, about what should be in uh, the records. And they should, this, if it's a blasting company, they should retain a copy of the records, but also generate a copy that should be handed to the, the quarry operator or quarry manager on the day. Profiler um, profiles the face to establish the burden, identify variances in the burden and enable the explosive supervisor to work out hole depth, direction, and help him to develop the blast specification. Now, again, your explosive supervisor or shot fire can be a profiler as well, and many cases are, uh, but it also could be, uh, you know, in Scotland, I come across guys and that's all they do for their company is profile. The driller uh, is then given instructions by the explosive supervisor, drills the hole to the correct depth, angle and azimuth, and he then, records drilling details on the driller's log. And that is, once he's completed the shot, that is passed to the explosive supervisor, becomes part of the, the blast records. And it is crucial that changes in the hardness of rock, any uh, geological anomalies or changes in the strata of the rock are recorded. So clay bands, um, cavities, anything at all like that. Now, we've outlined four different roles there. Um, the explosive supervisor, the shot fire, the profiler, and the driller. They all have to work together. It's important that they all do their job accurately um, and that there's checks and balances within the process to make sure that a blast goes off successfully. Um, and you know, they all have a, an important role to play um, because if information is not recorded or passed or there's inaccurate profiling, then that is a, a recipe for fly rock or misfires. So the process, I've been very PC and I have not picked any Northern Ireland company here. This, these are all photographs from Scotland. It's important that the quarry manager ensures that the face is properly cleaned out to allow the profilers to do their job. If there's still some material lying, you can't get an accurate picture. So profilers need to set up uh, and do their job properly. The driller uh, then has to set up uh, and drill as per instructions. The blasting team uh, then have to do their job on the day and Finally, there has to be an inspection um, and hopefully you get something similar to that blast. Um, that's actually a forestry and land Scotland, as they call themselves now, site. Um, and you can see it's a fair decent face and you know, they use that rock to form forest roads for harvesting. So when it comes to competence uh, of the quarrying company, either of the operator or the quarry uh, manager. The knowledge, technical expertise and experience to assess uh, the competence of drilling and blasting contractor must be there. There's a few of us long enough in the tooth that we did our own drill blasting. Uh, we possibly had our own uh, drill and driller um, or we used a contractor. So what the HSENI has said is that us boys are all too long in the tooth and we're not in direct control the way we used to be and that younger people coming up have not got this knowledge. Now, this is partly due to, because the same problem exists in the mainland or did a lot of the senior companies uh, in the mainland, the senior people says, oh, well, we've got a drill and blaster contractor, you don't need to know about blasting. You don't need any training. But if you take, go back to the operator's duties about assessing and monitoring the contractor, if you haven't the knowledge, uh, I came across companies in Scotland and the quarry manager was expected with no knowledge or competence to sign and approve the blast specification. 
And that was like signing a blank check because what he was saying, he didn't know what he was signing. Uh, he just was told he had to sign it. And we need to get away from that. One of the arguments I made with some senior people in Scotland was, well, if a blast goes wrong and upsets the neighbours, who do they phone? Do they phone your company or do they phone the drilling and blasting contractor? And he says, well, they phone us, well, I says, you're responsible by law and morally. So this is where this um, need for training uh, is coming from. Um, if you're being asked to monitor the performance and compliance of drilling and blasting contractors against legislation and company standards, you have to have a, a good work and knowledge uh, to be able to do that. Um, and if you're going to authorize uh, or ensure that explosive supervisors authorize sentries, then you need to know what you're authorizing them to do. Um, so we do need a degree of, of competence, and that means uh, knowledge, training, experience. And, you know, blasting is one of the most hazardous activities in the quarry because when it goes wrong, it goes spectacularly wrong. Um, and there's been instances of that that have been very well talked about on the mainland. There was one at Brayford, um, which is in Devon, I think, um, where there was three or four opportunities to stop or to rectify a problem, but none of them were actually taken. And uh, IROC, uh, which ended up that both the, the operator and the blasting company were quite heavily fined. So this is probably the bit that you really want to know about. Um, what are your options? So option one is the shot firing course. The syllabus is based on appendix one of the ACOP and it's uh, the basic knowledge that any shot fire should have. Now, Northern Ireland is slightly different from the mainland in terms of appointments. You've got the DOJ involved, and uh, one of the things in, in the Northern Ireland um, syllabus is the practical requirements of the Secretary of State's licenses. So the actual licenses that need to be held either by the, the operator or the blasting company. Uh, it would include storage, uh, issue, and conveyance of explosives and detonators, and that would include your, your boosters, etc. Uh, how to safely hand, handle and also how to <coughs> safely dispose of deteriorated explosives, including detonators, what to do, how to destroy them so that they, they don't uh, fall into the wrong hands or become unsafe. There has to be an element of design, uh, how to work out a blast specification, how to prevent fly rock, how to determine the, the danger zone. And one of the things that changed with the, the legislation is that it used to be that the boundary of your quarry uh, was your danger zone. If anything went beyond the boundary, uh, it was a fly rock incident, but now you can extend the danger zone beyond your quarry boundary. Uh, and that means that you have to make sure it's clear, warn people within that if it's outside uh, the, the boundary. Drilling, what methods of, of drilling and equipment can be used, how to profile and produce a set of profiles, including a, a plan of the, the shot area. And one of the things that is being looked for is that you have permanent markers to reference, certainly off the quarry plan and ideally to ordnance survey, but the the days of putting a mark on either side of the shot in the face are gone. That is no longer acceptable. Um, how to set up and uh, align drills in terms of the angle and the azimuth. Uh, both of those need to be recorded on the driller's log. Uh, how to check and measure holes. It's not a matter of taking the, the, 
neither the explosive supervisor or the shot fire should be taking the driller's word for it. Um, they should do checks themselves. Um, recognition of narial joints and other relevant information from the drill holes. Uh, so it means looking at the face, it means looking at um, the drill holes, looking at the driller's logs to see what information, and then safe shot firing procedures and practice. Uh, warnings, shelter. Now, all of this should be set out in your shot firing rules. And as operators, you can either develop your own rules uh, and give them to your blasting contractor, or you can accept theirs and approve them, or maybe tweak them, you know, put bits in, what neighbours have to be contacted, but there must be shot firing rules. It should set out what the warnings are. There should be a blast shelter to protect uh, the shot fire. Uh, inspection and, and measurement of quarry faces, how of vibration uh, and projection of material, how to stem, work out the, the depth of stem and methods of initiation, testing of equipment and circuits, examination of the blast site after firing and a record of that. And it should reference <laughs> relevant legislation and how to deal with misfires or, or fly rock. And that would include your radar reporting uh, and investigation of it. Now, an awful lot in that. Um, it's suitable for anybody progressing to shot fire. To be deemed a competent shot fire uh, or uh, explosive supervisor, you must have done the course, the knowledge course, plus an NVQ, and lots of you did that back around 2008-9. Um, there was funding available for that, and lots of people have the NVQ. The NVQ checks the competence, the application of the knowledge. Um, the knowledge in itself is not enough, and that is originally what... Uh, Ken Logan said in his letter, was the minimum standard for quarry managers. Uh, three hour exam, um, it's accredited by MP awards, you're part of M MPQC. It is an intense course. It, from what I hear, it's difficult to pass the course. Lots of people have to have two or three goals at it. Uh, and that's the feedback I'm getting from companies in the mainland and EPC UK are the, the main company who, who deliver it. Camborne School of Mines also deliver it. And MPQC are looking at producing a course uh, which was going to be delivered here in Northern Ireland. And um, they still are developing that course, but uh, there has been a change in opinion by HSENA, mainly due to the price of that course. It's well over £2,000, and it was felt that for small quarries blasting three, four times a year, that cost was prohibitive. So that was the original option, um, <coughs> and has now been replaced by option two. Four-day certificate course based on Appendix 1 of the ACOP, plus uh, a day on legislation and geotechnical information. Um, on the mainland, there was a course that was owned by a guy called Julian Clayton, but was delivered through um, MPQC, through the training arm, MP Skills. They have now bought that course, uh, and it was a three-day course. I'm looking at writing a Northern Ireland-based day on it and getting it incorporated into the, the course so that there's only one booking fee rather than having the book with MP uh, skills for one part of the three days of the course and one. There's less depth uh, to the content and there's a less onerous exam. And it's outside of my control, but we're hoping to pitch that course somewhere in the region of 1,000 to 1,200 pounds plus fat. Um, as I say, I can only lobby them in terms of, of the price but it would be a four-day course again. Uh, but it would be more multiple choice type questions than uh, a written exam.
the non blasting for non blasting managers course is mainly what is being used for quarry managers on the mainland. Um, so that is probably the main option uh, in relation to um, what will be available. Now, there's development of this course, rechecking it. Um, and I know somebody's going to ask me, well, when can we get this course? Realistically, I can't see it being available before Easter. Uh, so April, what we would intend doing, I would deliver the course uh, on behalf of MP Skills. And we've run it one day a week for four weeks. I, I don't think the industry here can afford to let people go for four days in one week. Plus, it's quite intense. Um, so it leaves a bit of time to think about what um, you've learned and go over it and revise it. Third option is Blast Design Course and Explosive Supervisor Award. Again, four-day course with more emphasis on blast design and environmental control than the shot firing course. And this course is mandatory to be an explosive supervisor. Now, whilst uh, being a volumina man, I wouldn't like to turn away business. If somebody came to me after doing some of these courses and says, well, I want to be a shot fire, I want the MVQ, or I want the level five explosive supervisor MVQ, the first thing I would ask you is, have you done the course and passed it uh, for each award or each role? And the second one is, how often are you blasting? Are you doing your own blasting? Because if you're doing it, still letting your contractor do it, you can't provide the evidence to actually do this. Uh, and I don't think it would be doing you a favor by trying to do it, to take your money and, and try and get you through the MVQs. Um, so I don't see that they will be necessary um, in relation to um, the level of competence that HSE and I are looking for. So that's if the, the option three is really if uh, you want to be an explosive supervisor. In option two, there will be enough blast design information that you will be able to look at a blast design and decide, you know, decide whether you're happy with it or not, or to be able to ask questions of the explosive supervisor uh, about the blast design. So competence assessment, level three diploma in shot firing, level five diploma in shot firing supervision. You must do the theory courses before, and you must uh, be a shot fire before you can be and have some practical experience before you have a shot fire and supervision um, award. Uh, the MBQ is, is pretty much, uh, well, we, we do check the knowledge. Um, there's discussions, professional discussion, but pretty much based on observation where I would go out and, and observe you and assess you against the criteria. Uh, it's a, an assessment of knowledge and application. Uh, and I don't see any quarry manager uh, applying for these and more awards unless they're going to do their own uh, shot firing or explosive supervisor. Now, there still are one or two people who do do their own shot firing, but uh, they're few and far between now. So we've looked at legal contacts, we've looked at duties, Quarry development, appointment of contractors, uh, duty holders, competence of operators or their appointed quarry manager, and the training options that will be available, as I say, probably from April onwards. So finally, any questions? I know there's been quite a lot in that, and in some areas, maybe not the detail that you would like to be aware of. So open to questions. David, thank you. That was uh, great. Um, going into good detail on all the information that we're, we're required tonight. Just on the course, you know, really, I'm right in saying this is a blasting for non-blasting managers course, a three-day course, um, which originally the HSE and I did not approve. 
yeah. but now with us adding on the extra day to cover the legislation and environmental, etc., <clears throat> that it has been approved. Yeah, HSC uh, has said that that would yeah. be acceptable. Now, it may yeah. not be called blasting for non-blasting managers. They may, now that they've bought the course of Julian, they may put a different title on it, but it, essentially it will be that course, John. Yeah. Plus uh, a Northern Ireland day. Yeah. Sorry. Is that the same course as we've done in Sterling, David? Yes, it is, Pat. Okay. Pat, you wouldn't need to do that again. You know, really, you would. all you'd need to do is the, the one day to cover the legislation and environmental, etc., for Northern Ireland. Would that be correct, David? Yes, I, I don't see it. That would be a problem if you've already done. When did you do it, Pat? A couple of years ago? Uh, I think so. Yeah, so you know, what did you think of the course? Very good. Very informative. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm glad I don't have to do a chat first one anyway. <laughs> I'm getting too old for all that. Yes. No, it was a very good course. Very good course, Dan. It was very informative, so it was. It definitely was, no doubt about it. Uh, now, if you're one of the people who did the... Uh, shot firing course or, or the MVQ um, you know 10 12 years ago and can prove that you've got continuing professional development that you're keeping up to date with your knowledge I don't see that you'll have to do this that would be my opinion um, because the MVQ is a, a one-off but you have to look at uh, CPD and you know with the the shot fires license, which is unique to Northern Ireland, to get your license renewed, you're having to prove CPD anyway. Uh, so you've got it there. Mm. Yeah. Hi, David. Uh, Rob Waddell here from Orca BQS. Just uh, talking about looking at it from a contractor's point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, the blasting competency uh, cards that we take from you. Yeah. Like, uh, is that enough? Is, Absolutely, is that... Rob. Yeah. yeah. You've done your MVQs and yeah. And that audit that I did with you is three years ago. Uh, you know, it's a comprehensive audit. There's what 64 pages of it. Uh, and that's just a check, and you know, there's professional discussion and that. And there's also a check that you're keeping up to date with training and new developments. So yeah. From that point of view, if you've got the NVQ uh, and are doing some sort of CPD, be that internal uh, or not, then that's sufficient. Okay. So in terms of my CPD, um, every couple of years, EPC run a day in Scotland, usually at Cumbernauld. And I would go to it every couple of years as a blast auditor. Now, there was none last year with COVID, but they hold standardization days. Um, and I go over to Nottingham and my uh, the guy that runs the scheme, Pat Bowles, plus all the auditors sit down and we, we have a standardization and we talk about best practice and so on. So that's where I keep my knowledge up to date. Yeah, the NVQ, David, that you talked about uh, several years ago, was that the one that was done in, in the down around Cookstown and Dungannon in the colleges there? Yeah, that's that's when it was done, yeah. That's okay. I've, I've done that one as well. That's okay. Those are all very quiet. I thought there have been a lot more questions. Now, down the line then, David, does that mean when we hand in our blast specification that the uh, I was going to say the quarry manager, he'll just be signing it off. He'll not be saying it. He'll just be saying he has the knowledge to understand what we're doing. Well, it, sh it should be checking your work, Mark, and checking that it's he's happy with the best last specification before he signs it. You but know. he's not signing an explosive supervisor. He's not taking responsibility. No, no he's merely approving no. it on behalf of your client, unless he is yeah. nominated himself as explosive supervisor, then that's a different story. Yeah. 
But then, David, does that not become a wee bit and a wee bit of a grey area there? Because at the end of the day, he has to be responsible in some aspect. Well, at the end of the day, he is responsible as the, the representative of the operator. Um, but this is the idea of training up quarry managers that they can make an informed decision. They don't have to be an expert. They don't have to have the NVQ, but they need to be able to know what they're looking at. Otherwise, yeah. it's a blank. I investigate a shot that went wrong oh, it must be 15, 16 years ago. Um, and when I said to the quarry operator who was signing off, uh, the blast specification, you know, what knowledge have you of explosives? None. Uh, so it was literally, uh, it would just be as the same as signing a blank check. Um, he was signing it and they could do whatever they want, but he had approved it. So that made him responsible as the operator or the owner of the company. Um, and it's to make sure that they can make, you know, they know what they're looking at, they know what they're signing that they're able to discuss, you know, if you come to them with a problem, that they're able to discuss and understand what your problem is and uh, give consent on, you know, an outcome or a, a solution to it, um, rather than saying that without any knowledge. So down the line, there'll be shot fire explosive supervisor and well, quarry operator, quarry manager. Um, what they have to do is either approve it or within their appointment nominate you to approve your own blast specification. That's yeah. your two options. Yeah, I don't if think... Approve, I, sorry, John. Not, if they approve no, it, I, I, they need to know how to, what they're approving. Yeah. No, I think going by the regulations, Mark, that, you know... The explosive supervisor is is responsible for the blast design and signing off the blast design, not the quarry manager. But the quarry manager is responsible as eight one C for the for the quarry overall. So from the minute you drive through the gate, it's the quarry manager's responsibility. So whether you're put there's <clears throat> the explosive supervisor or not, the quarry manager still has overall responsibility for you. Yeah. Yeah, uh, David, quick point. It's, sorry, it's Neil here from Ulster Industrial Explosives. Yeah. Um, years mm. ago, when they brought the new quarry regs in place, it was obviously shot fire and quarry managers used to sign off for blast specs. That was changed to remove and gain more knowledge uh, in the blast. And so that's why the, the, the new regulations were written, shot fire and explosive supervisors. Mm -hmm. So they're the two guys that take the overall control of the blast. The yeah. quarry manager's responsibility is the guy that he needs to make sure that the people doing all the individual tasks in the quarry are competent. So the regulations yep. aren't written the way Ken is trying to massage them here for his um, for his own gain, I think, you know? Obviously, there's always interpretations of, of uh, legislation and, and how it actually applies. Uh, but as I said at the start, the, the explosive supervisor is the guy who manages the shot firing operations, including organizing, profiling, drilling, providing or, or developing the uh, last specification. But the operator or his nominated 81C uh, quarry manager also has a responsibility to, as you say, to make sure that uh, what you're doing is safe and correct and they have a, a legal duty within the, the whole oversight of it. They can't just ask you as guys to come in and there you are guys, go ahead, sort that out for me and uh, absolve themselves of it. So would that be any different to the responsibility in, in terms of the quarry manager if he was to take in an electrical engineer, for example? I mean, he wouldn't be expected to have a qualification in electrical engineering, but he would still be responsible for the, their competence. I've had this conversation recently uh, with Mr. Logan and um, his view is that the operator's duties put a greater uh, legal duty on the operator or his quarry manager than that um, 
he's certainly not accepting that argument. Hi, David, it's Rob here again. Uh, <laughs> just, getting, just getting back there, what Neil was saying there a wee minute ago, like uh, a lot of years ago, there was a big push to put the emphasis or the responsibility towards the contractor. And uh, certainly I agree that the uh, quarry owner or manager should understand what he's signing off and should understand that. But at that time, uh, there was a big push to take it away from the from the quarry itself, push it towards the contractor. And that's, this seems to be a complete U-turn or a complete turnaround, you know? Um, yeah, that's correct, Rob, exactly. Yes, it is. And that happened in the mainland as well, where you know senior people and some of the major companies told their quarry managers who asked for training and shot firing, you don't need it. And there was that push, but that push was wrong. The the legislation clearly states the operator's duties. Um, and now it's being brought back to make them recognize their role. You know, it's back to the question. If something goes wrong with a blast, who gets the phone call? It's the operator or the quarry manager. Uh, it's not you guys, because they ha are seen as having a, the overall responsibility for it, uh, whether they are delegating it to a, a contractor or not. And if they do delegate it, uh, what, you know, if you take delegation, you can delegate the task and the responsibility, but not the accountability. But David, as Sam Eccles here, yes, sir. I think I think it's, it's, it's relevant to any contractor you bring on site, whether it be an electrical contractor, whether it be a hydraulic contractor. I mean, does does the NHE or the HSENA expect the the owner operator or the quarry manager to be um, not not only qualified in explosives, but qualified in electricity or hydraulics or hydrology or any of them things. I work on knowledge of it. When I went to Doncaster to do the DAPS course uh, the first night, Phil Poppard said, you don't have to be an expert in all areas, but you need to have enough knowledge to know whether an electrician or a fitter or last supervisor or whoever, uh, to be able to make a sound judgment based on uh, what they're telling you. So you need to have a work of knowledge of it, um, but not be an expert in it and not fully competent or fully qualified in it, Sam. Uh, but you're right, it applies to any contractor that you bring through the gate. Uh, you're responsible for them and you need to make sure that the people that you bring through are competent, that they work safely uh, to your rules, and you have to monitor uh, them. Some of the companies in the mainland have got this contractor management uh, system. They, they call it a RAG system, red, amber, green. And what the, the managers expect it to do is to monitor the contractor on site. If they make some sort of break the rules or do something unsafe, they're given a warning and they go on to amber. And if they repeat it, they go on to red. And when they go on to red, they're out the gate. They're not used again. So there is, you're right, it is any contractor. Uh, but at the minute, it's the blast and it's specifically under the spotlight. Yeah. Oh, I understand. I understand that, David. That's, uh, I mean, we, as you know, I'm ex tarmac and, and, and we had that system. Yeah. It was it was a good system. It was. But I mean, I, I kind of see that. Uh, there's a great, a great pressure to put onto quarry manager operators just with explosives alone at the minute. And, and I don't think he's at the HSENA is looking at the, the other things, like you know. Well, it's the topical one, and you know, we've had the dust and uh, silica dust and you know, canteens and cabs and cabins and so on. Uh, it's just something that's come into focus at this minute in time. Yeah. Um, that, you know, undoubtedly there'll be something else for all this. Yeah, Divi, uh, Piers Corwin, yeah, I, I think it's important that this highlights uh, the, the, in terms of the quarry regs, overall responsibility of the quarry manager, that everything on site that takes place is ultimately <laughs> his or her responsibility. Mm -hmm. I, I do think that this, this should really have been more of a general uh, contractor management 
because I think the, I think the theory is correct in that we need to have a a working knowledge of what the people we are uh, choosing to employ on site to do jobs on our behalf mm-hmm. are doing. Um, but yes, I think yes, we, we should have that knowledge, working knowledge for the guys doing the blasting and for the guys doing electrical work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So well, I think it's important to highlight it, I think the, it should be more general covering all contractors and not just specifically the blasting. Maybe that'll come. It probably will, Pierce. But yes, you're quite right. Uh, if you've got a good system of appointing contractors, mm-hmm. um, it will apply to this situation uh, as well. But the, there is still this question because of the seriousness uh, of if it goes wrong mm-hmm. they're they're looking at you know what quarry managers actually know and how much they know yeah. in relation to blasting as i say this is the one that's under the spotlight at the moment but it undoubtedly will move to something else next year yeah Maybe. but in in, ter- in terms of legislation david do, uh, are contractors ranked in any form is, is... Does the legislation point out uh, blasting operations is more risky than any other operation and, and, and do more care then? Or are all, are all subcontractors equal? No, that's a question, Pierce. I, it's inferred, but I don't think it actually states anywhere to the best of my knowledge. Mr. Rob, here again, David, I definitely that's shouldn't. Yeah. No. Yeah, uh, definitely not. Mm-hmm. Uh, it should shouldn't be emphasising in one particular area. Mm-hmm. I had this. I, I had. I had that conversation with Ken at the start of all this. That you know, the, the problems that he had uh, observed and seen. I said well, that sounds like more like people weren't um, controlling their contractors more so than knowledge of blasting. You know, it was. They weren't watching what they were doing, but his, you know, the HSEs, then answer to that there as well, then you need to have the knowledge to know what you're looking at. Mm-hmm. Um, which, you know, brings it back to training of, of your of your managers. Um, uh, all uh, From the outset, I was totally against having to do this four day course you know, two and a half grand for 12 hours training for a, an exam that I probably would fail. Um, but I would be quite happy to go and do this blasting for non-blasting managers courses, what it used to be, which does give you knowledge and any junior managers coming through there, you know, why don't you want knowledge to manage your site? You know, it's all part of your training, part of your CPD. So I don't see what the, the issue is on this. Well, John, uh, just what you're saying there, well, if that's the case and you're going, going to continue to use a contractor, well, surely that's the course that makes sense uh, for for cost and uh, responsibility. Uh, mm. you know, yeah, so I, yeah. I, absolutely, Rob. You know, and that's the course that, you know, the, the one that we're sort of recommending or, you know, Recommending is the wrong word. You know the the three the options are there. You know if you want one of your junior managers or trainees to go and become a shot fire or do a shot fire course to be blast to continue to be on to be a blast supervisor, well then that's up to the company in particular. You know if you don't want to do that and you just want to you know have the knowledge to to manage your contractor so to speak, well then you do the the lesser course. With the quarry management, uh, with, the, with the amount of work with quarry management nowadays, John, it would be impossible to, to carry out your practical duties in the shop firing anyway, you know, because there's so much else going on, you know. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I, I agree totally with you. You couldn't do it. Um, but, you know, the, the options are there for all the training. You know, as I say, I wouldn't be one that would be putting my name down to go and do the full shot firing or expose a supervisor course. But, you know, there's guys out there that maybe would want to do that. Mm-hmm. Again, sorry, it's, yeah. pa- it's Paul Fitzpatrick here again, sorry. Um, um, I, I agree with John there about, I mean, the, the expanding 
of of knowledge and on getting to know what your subcontractors are doing and and even going back to uh, the, the 12 years ago or the NVQs that were done, I mean, it, it expanded knowledge then and, and it, it helped companies like ourselves, I think, to, to improve and to get people on that that uh, that list. We're a, we're a small family business mm-hmm. and, and we're trying to, to, uh, to look at this legislation and apply it to our own business. But when it comes to how you uh, how this is going it seems to be going directly against all other movements in legislation including cdm regs and including uh, how contractors and subcontractors are looked after and how competence is assessed even when it comes to individuals com- competence is assessed by certification or nvqs or or whatever it is that that you can then look to see how Mm-hmm. And how you compare one contractor with another, and how how things can be, uh, how you can be confident in in taking a contractor on, and uh, this seems to fly in the face of all that by saying, you no, know, the person who who uh, is employing that contractor has to stand over them now, uh, and and have the knowledge to be, to identify uh, issues in their work. Um, if you take CDM, for example, I mean, it may be a contractor on a CDM site that has to blast. It may be a contractor that has to do on the CDM site that has to uh, do whatever other professional activity that, that needs a, a, le- a level of competence that has to be certified or usually has to be certified. But the person or the company that's over that site doesn't necessarily have to have those those skills to do that to to be able to identify what is right or wrong in that that practice but uh, would depend on this the 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 system the legislative legislative and training and certification system that is there to prove that you're, you're actually trying to to appoint somebody competent to do the work rather than be able to be more competent than that person that company or that subcontractor itself the legislation has always been there paul and cdm the principal contractor whether he appoints a contractor or whether it's the client appoints a contractor once he takes control of the site he's responsible for everything on that site and if it goes wrong he cannot absolve himself Precisely, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not getting away from that at all. When yeah. I don't, I'm not trying to get away from that at all. No, I don't but think it, you but, are, it, but, but, but it is a completely, but this completely turns it about face, and by saying that they, not only has the, that employer to, to uh, ensure the competence, but that employer needs to have a, a level of confidence, confidence that they can. Uh, Pull apart any any issues that, that are that to be able to identify them. But now, the legal duty has always been there. It just hasn't been enforced, uh, and it's been well ignored. Is maybe too strong a word. Well, I think it's but been it's interpreted away from it, and now it's been turned back and, and brought into the focus. When, I think it's a level of interpretation. If you take uh, yes, you're you're giving examples there in in. Uh, Across the water of, of companies who were who were taking this on, and there may be some examples here even. But when you take a small company, Quarian, uh, and and uh, the my brother would be the, the quarry manager here, and and if I have him trained up to do that, and then he goes on holidays for a couple of weeks, or for, in this particular time here, we have uh, all sorts of reasons why people may not be at work. Yeah, at work, yeah, and and. Uh, and the issues there are to deal with that uh, means that he can't depend on, as, as this has been laid out, he can't depend on uh, the level of competence of of a contractor to do the work without him being present, which uh, to me, there has to be some something there that, that they, that isn't right in, in terms of how we've been moving along 
in terms of CDM has been moving along in terms of all the other legislation to, on how to deal with that. So that's just my viewpoint on that. <laughs> but it makes it very difficult for, for the smaller company, whereas larger companies can move uh, quarry managers from one quarry to another as they need to, but, but uh, uh, we wouldn't have that luxury. No, I'll take your point and understand uh, what you're saying. Um, but um, if somebody was in the holiday or somebody was off ill, um, you would have to make arrangements for cover in some way. Um, how you would actually do that, I'm not sure. As you say, you're a family firm, and are you going to bring somebody in from outside? No, I don't think that's reasonable. Any other questions, sir? Gentlemen, are any? Hi, David, it's Roy here. Um, is there an exam or any form of assessment that... Uh, there um, is, yes. Yes, there is, Roy, but it's not as onerous as the four-day shot firing course. Um, you could maybe answer, Pat, but you know, some of it's multiple choice and some of it yeah. you have to write in an answer. It's a, a sort of blended uh, assessment. Some there's some practical and some 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 multiple choice. That's very good. Yeah, I can't sell it anymore for you, David. It's very good. <laughs> That's all right. How much are you paying him? Take ten the post part. Uh, yes, go. <laughs> <laughs> I bet a commission there. <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, boys, it is, and it's not it's not as near as intense as this as that bloody old shot round thing. It's not no. You know, but it gives you a good work of knowledge. That's right. It does. It really does. And it's very interesting too. Davey, I think it might be worthwhile saying that when this started off, Ken was in a different position or a different mindset. He was, he is now. yes. He, he has. He, he, he has come back to what our initial thoughts were. You know, I remember saying to him, Ken, you can't stipulate a requirement. What you can do is stipulate a minimum requirement. And I think yeah. the, the answer to a number of the guys' questions there, you know, the, the secrets in the in the wording of the course, blasting for non-blasting ma uh, uh, managers. And I think somebody raised the point there, and a couple of people raised the point of equating it to, you know, to, to you know, work on it with electricity. You know, if something goes wrong, God forbid, with electricity, somebody obviously can get killed, but it's very much an internal issue. If something goes wrong with a blast, there's all sorts of connotations in terms of public image, everything else, your future planning, uh, et cetera, uh, and, and the whole image of your company. And I think, you know, as an industry, we're under more of a spotlight than ever before. And certainly blasting is one of the major issues. And any of you that have been through a planning application or through a planning appeals co uh, course in the last number of years will, will, know what I'm talking about. In fact, I had a conversation this week with Ken. There's an individual who's involved as an objector to the Creevy Quarry application, has now nearly set himself up as a Nuren Brokovich type character and has raised all sorts of hackles about blasting on exclusion zones. He has gone through a couple of political representatives to Angus Kerr. Now, Angus Kerr, Head of Strategic Planning at DFI hasn't the responsibility. It's it's the HSE. So I would just like everybody be aware that there, there are other connotations to this. And when we need as an industry to have every I dotted and every T crossed in terms of protecting the right to operate. Yeah, that's a fair point, Gordon. Uh, and, and you're quite right. Uh, what is you know both in terms of content and knowledge uh, and cost, um, Ken has compromised on that. I know it's maybe not uh, something that people really are embellishing or looking forward to doing, but um, it is a good course. Uh, I haven't personally sat it, but um, you've heard from Pat, and it's the minimum that. You, you know, the industry is going to get away with. And it does bring it into line with the current legislation. Uh, just because 
it wasn't enforced and it wasn't uh, applied and it, it, in some, you know, it was, I say ignores maybe a too strong a word, but uh, doesn't mean that it doesn't have to be looked at. And, you know, if you read the, the quarry regs and the Northern Ireland Explosives regs of 2006, together uh, as complementary pieces of legislation. It clearly sets out that there is a duty on the operator or his appointed quarry manager to have the knowledge and to be able to manage this. And you can't get away from it. Uh, David know. Neil here again. Um, just nice. obviously with the current situation, um, you mentioned this course maybe be available after Easter. Is it going to be in a, uh, done online, something similar to this? Hopefully not. I think it's a course that needs face-to-face -face, uh, interaction and interaction with the people attending it. Um, it remains to be seen what happens um, with the executive's policies. Um, I would hope not, Neil, uh, but it may be. I, I just can't answer that. Okay. Well, then, David, if it, if it is that it's better done face-to-face, is the industry going to be allowed a bit, bit of time here then until the, the sort of the current COVID situation sets, settles down? You know, if this is to be done correctly? Um, I'm not the man to answer that one. Uh, I don't know. I know I've been told to get it organised and get it run as soon as possible. Um, but uh, whether there will be a dispensation or because of COVID, uh, it's not my call, Neil. Okay. Uh, I, haven't, Neil, I, I haven't heard a, a, a time scale set uh, from the HSE and I. There's been no definitive saying you must have this done by the end of July or anything like that. So, you know, if it takes to the end of April, May before we can get the courses up and running, you know, that's the way it is, you know, and, you know, the, the, yeah. the industry will just have to, you know, we'll, we'll get through it. As... It's outside of everybody's control. Right. Yeah. yeah, it was just when the initial sort of request came in from Ken Logan, you know, he was obviously yeah. sending out, you know, course dates, you know, for January, February, March, he was really outlining, you know, this needs to be done, and et cetera, et cetera. But it, obviously with talking to you guys tonight, he seemed to have settled down a little bit on it. There's a process to get through to make this course deliverable, um, and that's yeah. in MPQC's hands. Based on the, the original four-day shot firing course, I started talking to them at the beginning of December, and it's now February, and, and it's still not uh, ready. Um, and this one here, I think it'll take them a few weeks to get it into a position where it can be delivered. Okay. At least a few weeks. If, if if this is the course that Ken's looking for, I think somebody should, or this the this is what we will have to do. This one here, I think everybody should grab it with both hands, because it's, uh, you know, it's it's the course. Plus the fact, David, you're going to have to do it face to face because a lot of the practical stuff will have to be done face to face. That's my opinion. Yeah, and uh, you know, my personal opinion is. 10 to 12 people in a course is, yeah. is enough. Uh, if you go for bigger numbers, then somebody's going to get lost. Absolutely. Uh, just because there, there's always somebody who is more attention grabbing within courses. Um, 10 to 12 is a manageable number, but if you go up to 15 to 20, I think it's too many people in a room. Even from a COVID point of view, it's too many people in a room. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we're maybe... Wrap it up there if there's no more questions for David. I think we've nearly exhausted everything and hopefully that's got everybody as much information as they require at the minute and we'll keep everybody posted as we go to see when the, the courses do become available. Could I ask Stephen Robinson please to uh, just say a wee vote of thanks to David on behalf of the, the branch? Well, uh, good evening everyone. Um, there's a few of us on here this evening have been in quarry nearly as long as Davy. Um, the uh, but um, we've seen a lot of re regulation in our time, and uh, we do need reminding of our duties and responsibilities in the industry, you know, at regular occasions. Um, 
we live in a constantly changing world and keeping up with it's never easy. And uh, if this is what the world is changing towards now, then it's up to us in the industry to meet that and um, raise the challenge. Uh, David's put in um, uh, a great presentation there tonight. We've run a minute overtime. Um, as, our, as our meetings usually run an, an hour and like all presentations, there's a lot of work in the background goes on uh, to put these things together. There's a lot of questions that have been raised and the sound of thing has raised a few more few more questions, which I'm sure David will have been hand to answer at some stage along the line. On behalf of the Institute of Quarry and the Northern Ireland branch, uh, I'd like to thank David for his time and efforts here this evening to bring together, which is no doubt a difficult sub subject. It's never regulations never palatable at the best of time. Um, but you've made an excellent job, David. And I'd like everyone to show their appreciation in the normal manner. Thank you very much, David. Thank you.